Okay, so welcome to this third part of the video on long-term potentiation. So I have found out what snare proteins actually stands for. Basically, SNAP, this bit here, SNAP, SNAP25, uh, SNAP in this context stands for Soluble NSF Attachment Protein. So I will write that down. So uh, SNAP stands for Soluble NSF attachment protein. And basically then what SNARE stands for is it stands for SNAP receptor, uh, but then you get rid of the P for some reason. Sna soluble NSF attachment protein. So basically uh, SNARE really stands for soluble NSF attachment protein receptor. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, now what we've had, what, what, what the point at which we are at with our uh, glutamatergic synapse transmission is that we've released the glut glutamate into the um, synaptic cleft. Now the glutamate is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft to our uh, postsynaptic membrane here. Now in the postsynaptic membrane we're going to have receptors for glutamate. Okay, and I'm going to draw two types of uh, receptors because usually you'll have two types of, recept of glutamate receptors in your axon terminal. Basically, what you'll usually have is you'll usually have AMPA receptors. This is it, in most common, you'll find AMPA receptors with NMDA receptors, NMDA glutamate receptors. So you find two ionotropic glutamate receptors here, and I want to color code them. So let's have AMPA receptors in this red color here. So that, that's an AMPA receptor here. This is an AMPA receptor. And then the other one is going to be an NMDA receptor. Okay, right, so there's a very big difference between AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. So I'm just going to colour in NMDA, I'll have as blue. NMDA. And the main difference is that um, if we look at those, if we remember about NMDA receptors, NMDA receptors are blocked by magnesium ions at... Um, at um, negative electrical potentials. So basically, if we remember back to that uh, current voltage relationship for the NMDA receptor, what we had was that if we plot voltage across the cell membrane, and we're just doing voltage from extracellular to intracellular, and we plot against that, we plot uh, current from intracellular to extracellular, then remember what happens for the AMPA receptor. If we've got a cell membrane here, and we've got a piece of a uh, some AMPA receptor here, and we open the AMPA receptor by binding glutamate to it. Um, okay, so here's our AMPA receptor. And remember, uh, the AMPA receptor consists of four subunits, and each of them has a ligand binding domain for glutamate. So you need to bind four glutamates to each of those ligand binding domains to get at least four conductance. Of course, we've discussed in the mechanisms of conductance um, video about how if you bind less than four glutamates to um, the receptor, then um, what's going to happen is that you're going to get some opening of that pore, but you won't get the full opening. And that uh, that's, um, partial opening does actually lead to conductance. It just doesn't lead to full conductance. Okay, but let's suppose we bound four glutamates to this AMPA receptor here. So this is an AMPA receptor. Uh, then uh, it's fully open, okay? And we are asking, basically, at different electrical potential differences across this cell membrane, what is the current going to be through this cell, uh, well, from the intracellular here to the extracellular? So let's think. If the electrical potential difference was negative, that would mean that the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment was lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. Okay, right. So, uh, this AMPA receptor conducts monovalent cations mainly. It can conduct a tiny bit of calcium, but to be honest, it's negligible. Really, it's just permeable to sodium and potassium. Sodium is very high outside the cell, and potassium is very high within the cell. Uh, and uh, basically, um, we've also know that the electrical potential difference is negative. 
So basically that's going to pull positive ions into the cell. And yes, okay, some potassium is going to leave, but the amount of potassium leaving the cell is basically going to be much smaller than the amount of sodium moving into the cell. So overall, you get a net movement of positive charge into the cell, i.e. you're moving positive charge from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. Now, we are measuring current from intracellular to extracellular we have got a current going in the opposite direction. That counts as a negative current going from the intracellular to the extracellular. So basically, we, uh, we find, we would expect, and indeed it's true that it is the case, that when you've got a negative electrical potential difference, you uh, get a negative current from intracellular to extracellular. And basically what happens is that as you raise the electrical potential difference across this membrane, as you start making it, let's say, positive, then now that means the intracellular compartment is going to be positive for the extracellular compartment. So now positive charge is going to want to leave the intracellular compartment and it's going to want to go into the extracellular compartment because it wants to be at the lower electrical potential. So now what happens is the potassium current out becomes massive and the sodium current in gets smaller, if not completely reversing in the opposite direction and going out and then you get a net movement out basically so you get a positive current from intracellular to extracellular positive charge is moving from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment and what you actually get is a current uh, voltage relationship that looks like this it's sort of like pretty much linear right NMDA that doesn't happen at all well it happens at the positive electrical potentials okay so let's draw an NMDA receptor here Firstly, the first complication of NMDA receptors is that they have uh, that co-agonist. They, um, they need either two glycine molecules or two D-serine molecules, because remember, the um, two of the subunits of the NMDA receptor are glu-N1s, and their ligand binding domain binds uh, serine or, well, D-serine or L-glycine. I'll go over that again in a moment. Uh, but that's the first complication, but let's suppose we have got the agonist for the receptors completely right and the receptor is open. Then if we do the same experiment as we've just done for AMPA, then what we get is the same result, because remember it's still permeable to sodium, potassium. The only difference is now that it's permeable to calcium, but that shouldn't affect things too much. Um, so again, if you've got, uh, if you've got high sodium outside the cell, high calcium outside the cell, and low potassium intracellularly. If you've got a positive electrical potential difference, i.e. if the intracellular compartment is more, if its electrical potential is higher than the extracellular compartment, then basically positive charge is going to want to get out, and that's going to lead to a positive current going from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment. So basically, the current out will beat the current in, and that holds true. So if I draw the NMDA graph here, it's basically exactly the same for all positive electrical potentials. And it stays the same until you start getting to an electrical potential of around minus 20 millivolts, basically. Okay, and when you get basically to that electrical potential, then basically now the intracellular electrical potential difference, rather, the intracellular compartment is now more neg is negative of the extracellular compartment. So its electrical potential is lower than the extracellular compartment. Now, basically, there are magnesium cations in the extracellular uh, space. If the intracellular compartment is more is a lower electrical potential than the extracellular compartment, these magnesium ions are going to want to move into uh, into the intracellular compartment, and basically, they move into the NMDA receptor, and they get stuck, and they block the NMDA receptor, basically. So that stops all current. So basically, as you get more negative, more magnesium blocks the NMDA receptor. And basically, what happens is that your current tails off to zero eventually, basically, like that, because these magnesium ions are sitting in your uh, pore and blocking you. And the more negative is the electrical potential uh, difference across this membrane, the more the magnesium is going to, uh, more likely is the magnesium ion going to be sitting in this pore, blocking it, basically. So, if we consider this um, postsynaptic cell here, then uh, let's think about what's going to happen now. Well, uh, 
basically the AMPA receptor, if we just have a quick revision of the structure of the AMPA receptor, the AMPA receptor is made up of four uh, subunits, four subunits, and basically all of these subunits bind glutamate. So you need to get four glutamate molecules to bind to each one of these four subunits to open the pore completely. And as I've discussed before, um, there is some leeway with that. You know, if you bind free to it, then it opens the pore enough for you to have at least some conductance. And in fact, there's three different conductance states for the AMPA receptors. And it's not yet known what those, how many, you know, what those three conductance states correspond to either, i.e. does the first conductance state correspond to having one glutamate bound? Does the second conductance state correspond to two glutamates bound? Does the third co conductance state correspond to having three or four? We don't know how it's uh, how it's working. We would have expected there to be four conductance states, but there's only three, i.e. because you've got four uh, molecules of glutamate that you combine, but experimentally there is only three, so we don't yet know what um, binding state of glutamate each one of those conductance states corresponds to. Okay, but for the basis of this discussion, we'll just assume that four glutamate molecules are bound to that AMPA receptor and that it is now fully conductive. The NMDA receptor is slightly more complicated Basically, NMDA receptors are, uh, are, have to be heterotetramers. You can't have homotetramers of NMDA receptors. And two of the subunits that make up NMDA receptors, let's draw them, actually we'll draw them in blue, uh, two of the subunits that make up NMDA receptors have to be what are known as GLU-N1 subunits. So these two, let's say, are GLU-N1 subunits. And basically, the other two subunits can then be any of, well, they can't be any of them. There are certain heterotetramers that are allowed, but they are other non-GLU-N1 subunits. So I'll just put non-GLU-N1s. Okay, and basically, the GLU-N1 subunits want to buy, their ligand binding domains bind, instead of glutamate, they bind the amino acid glycine or the amino acid D-serine. So they can bind either of those two. And the non glue N1 subunits, they still bind glutamate. Now, glycine and, glycine and D-serine are present enough, well, glycine certainly is, in the extracellular fluid that these sites are always occupied, pretty much. In physiological circumstances, they're always going to be occupied. So in actual fact, to activate this receptor, all you need is two glutamate molecules to come in and bind to the two non uh, glue N1 subunits, ligand binding domains, and that will open the receptor. Okay, so we'll continue our discussion in the next video.